Hello everyone, my name is Syed Quadri, and today I'm going to be talking to you about occlusion culling, specifically using hardware occlusion queries. So here's an overview of what I'll be discussing today. We're going to first look at what is occlusion culling, then we're going to briefly list out the countless occlusion culling techniques out there, but then we're just going to focus on different methods using hardware occlusion queries, and then we'll wrap it up at the end with a summary of what we learned. So what is occlusion culling then? Well, it's very simple actually. The term occlusion culling refers to a method that tries to reduce the rendering load on the graphic system by eliminating or culling objects from the rendering pipeline if they are hidden or occluded by other objects in the scene. Let me start off with a simple example. Imagine you have a scene where there are a million cubes lined up. Position the camera so that you can only see the front cube. The rendered image would show only the frontmost cube, as you can see in the image on the right. The rest of the 999,999 cubes are essentially hidden from view. Without occlusion culling techniques, you would have to render all 1 million cubes. Now imagine the same scenario, but with occlusion culling on, you would only be rendering the frontmost cube. You would still end up getting the same rendered image as before, but with increased performance as you are not rendering geometry hidden by objects closer to the camera. So here's a list of occlusion culling techniques out there. There's early Z rejection, which uses the depth and stencil buffers. There's hardware occlusion queries that we'll look at in just a bit. I won't be going into much detail on the others, but I thought I'd include them here if you want to check them out later. Hardware occlusion queries are a more GPU friendly approach and is probably the most popular after simple yet costly early Z rejection. So we're just gonna focus on them for the rest of the presentation. So the occlusion query feature lets us avoid rendering hidden objects. By skipping the entire rendering process for a hidden object, we can reduce the rendering load on the GPU. It rejects polygons at the geometry level and requires you to sort the objects from front to back. Hardware occlusion queries are appealing to today's games because they work in completely dynamic scenes. In OpenGL, the ARB occlusion query extension, which is based on NVIDIA's extension, implements the occlusion query idea on the GPU and fetches the query results. Microsoft has incorporated the same functionality since DirectX 9. An occlusion query is fundamentally simple. First, you need to initiate an occlusion query. Next, you need to turn off writing to the frame buffer and depth buffer. This allows the GPU to rasterize at a much higher speed. Next, you need to render a simple approximation of the complex object, usually a bounding box, which will be used for depth testing. Pixels that pass depth testing will not be rendered on the screen because rendering and depth writing were disabled. Then we terminate the occlusion query, which resets the counter of visible pixels. Next, we reset the writing to the frame and depth buffer so the object can be rendered to the screen. Then, we'll ask for the result of the query, that is the number of visible pixels of the bounding box. Finally, we decide if we render the object. If the number of pixels drawn is greater than some threshold, typically zero, we render the complex object. Otherwise, we don't, because that object is being occluded. However, this basic approach is not often used for solving visibility culling. This is due to two main problems. The overhead caused by issuing the occlusion queries themselves, since each query adds an additional draw call, and the latency caused by waiting for the query results. This sparks some to make improvements and ultimately make hardware occlusion queries more beneficial for all. The first improvement is to use a hierarchy structure. The hierarchical stop and wait method utilizes a spatial hierarchy tree to group objects close to one another so that we can treat them as a single object for the occlusion query. This results in a tree structure with interior nodes that group other nodes and leaf nodes that contain the actual geometry. The big advantage of using hierarchies for occlusion queries is that we can now test interior nodes which contain much more geometry than the individual objects. Pretty simple, but there are some issues, especially with the similar delay of waiting for the query result. One of the biggest problems with this method is the stalling that occurs. Whenever we issue an occlusion query for a node, we cannot continue our algorithm until we know the result. When the result finally returns, the CPU figures out what to draw and sends commands to the GPU, but the GPU has become idle for some time, leading to GPU starvation. The other drawback is the query overhead. If many objects are visible within a scene, the number of queries is increased significantly. Before, we would simply query each individual object, but with this method, we also have to add queries for their groupings as well. 
So we improve the ideal scenario where many objects are included, but now the worst case scenario where many objects are visible is even slower than before. So the hierarchical stop and wait method does not make good use of occlusion queries. Is there another improved culling method? There is, and it's called Coherent Hierarchical Culling, or CHC for short. Instead of waiting for a result, this method guesses the outcome of a query by examining the previous frame. Objects tend not to move around too much from one frame to the next, so if we know what's visible and what's occluded in one frame, then it's very likely those same objects will be visible and occluded in the following frame. However, there are two edge cases where we can go wrong. So if we want to have correct images, we need to verify our guess and fix our assumption in case it was wrong. We do this whenever the query result arrives. This method also reduces the overhead caused by the occlusion queries for interior nodes. Since we are guessing the state of a node, we don't even need to issue a query for visible nodes because at the end of the frame, this information can be easily deduced. On the other hand, occlusion queries for previously invisible nodes are essential. They are required to verify our choice to not process the node. This all boils down to the fact that we issue queries only for previously visible leaf nodes and that an invisible leaf node is not tested if its parent is invisible as well. So then, how does CHC stack up in terms of performance? Unfortunately, not that well. It works very well for scenes that have a lot of occlusion, However, on newer hardware where rendering geometry becomes cheap compared to querying or viewpoints where much of the scene is visible, this method can become even slower than view frustum culling. This is a result of wasted queries and unnecessary state changes. So is there something else out there that can improve upon CHC? Can we do better? Yes, there is, and it's an improvement to CHC called CHC++. So a quick overview of what makes CHC++ so special. It uses query batching and has separate queues for previously visible and previously invisible nodes. It also utilizes multi-queries, which are able to cover more nodes by a single occlusion query. Another feature is that it applies a randomized sampling pattern of scheduling queries for previously visible nodes. Another staple of this method is the use of tight bounding volumes without the need of their explicit construction. In order to switch between render and query mode, there needs to be a state change. What I mean by state change is that we have to disable writing to the depth and color buffers before we query and then we must re-enable writing to the same buffers before we render. If we are using complex shaders too, we have to turn them on and off. The old CHC method would have to initiate a state change for every node that needs to be queried. As you can see, switching the states can get redundant. This switching of states has a huge cost. It turns out that changing the rendering state causes an even larger overhead than the query itself. So CHC++ tries to reduce the number of state changes to an acceptable amount. So what CHC++ introduces is this idea that we have two separate queues, one for previously visible nodes called the VQ, which I'll get into in the next slide, and the IQ for previously invisible nodes. So the idea is very simple. We store candidate nodes in the IQ until the number of nodes in the queue reaches a user-defined size. Once it's full, we change the state for querying and then issue an occlusion query for each node in the IQ. Once all the previously invisible nodes have been queried, we change the state for rendering. A big advantage of this is that we only have two state changes, which is a lot less than what we had before with the old CHC method. So what about previously visible nodes? CHC++ stores the incoming nodes to be queried in a separate queue called the VQ. The query for these nodes is not critical as the result will only be used in the next frame. CHC++ exploits this by processing nodes to fill up waiting time, so we sneakily process some nodes when there is nothing else to do. Then when the result of the previously visible nodes return, we stop processing nodes from the VQ. At the end of the frame, when all the queries for previously invisible nodes have been processed, we continue to process the result of the nodes from the VQ. I hope you all noticed something. We had zero state changes. As it turns out, in the vast majority of cases, there is no need to change the render state at all 
as it was already changed when we were query batching the previously invisible nodes. The next building block is the concept of multi-queries. Before in CHC, we had to issue one occlusion query per previously invisible node. With CHC++ and multi-queries, we can cover more nodes with a single occlusion query. Imagine we had a scene with multiple cars, and each car also has an engine, but these are hidden from view because of the hood. These engines remain invisible for an extended amount of time and are likely to continue to stay invisible for the foreseeable future. So we first test to see how many invisible nodes can we single query. In our case, this number would be correlated to the number of hidden car engines. Instead of querying each car engine, we simply query one time for all the car engines. So if we had 10 cars, we only multi-query one time, saving 9 individual queries. But how about for dynamic scenes where we have objects moving in and out of the camera view and we have multiple different types of objects? How do we estimate the optimal number of invisible nodes to add into a single multi-query? To do this, we first need to estimate the coherence of visibility. This means with knowing the visibility state of a particular node, either visible or invisible, we aim to estimate the probability that this node will keep its visibility state in the next frame. There is a strong correlation of this value with the history of the node, or the number of frames that the node has kept the same visibility state. Nodes that have been invisible for a very long time are likely to stay invisible, such as a car engine. This quantifiable measure of a node's history is known as visibility persistence. So now that we know the visibility of coherence, we can now determine the optimal size of a multi-query. Instead of evaluating all possible partitions of the batch into multi-queries, we use a greedy model which maximizes a benefit cost ratio for each multi-query. While the IQ is not empty, we add a node to a multi-query. Then we determine the cost-benefit ratio using the equations below. We can calculate the ratio with the equation on the right for V. It turns out that the V reaches a maximum for a particular number of nodes, and then once we find the maximum, we can issue the multi-query. If not, we loop back and continue to add another node and repeat the process. After we find the maximum V and issue the multi-query, we repeat the entire algorithm again for the rest of the nodes in the IQ. As a result, we create larger multi-queries for nodes with a high probability of staying invisible and smaller multi-queries for nodes which are likely to turn visible. So we discussed about a lot of different queues. This image shows all the different types of queues used within CHC++. And you can see the two new ones, the IQ for previously invisible nodes and the VQ for previously visible nodes. And as you can also see, we have a multi-query for the previously invisible nodes in the query queue. So this kind of just wraps up everything that we just talked about. Another building block is the randomization of visible nodes. Like the old method, CHC++ assumes a visible node to stay visible for T-frames and will only be tested every T-frames. While this helped reduce the number of queries, the queries were temporarily aligned. This alignment becomes problematic when nodes tend to become visible in the same frame, as you can see in the graph. If four nodes become visible at frame 3, as shown by the red visibility event line, and we assume that they stay visible for five frames, then all four nodes will be tested at the same times at frame 8, frame 13, and frame 18. The average number of queries per frame will still be reduced, but the alignment can cause observable frame drops. The solution? We randomize the first invocation of the occlusion query. So after a node has turned visible, we use a random value r between 0 and t for determining the next frame when a query will be issued. After the first invocation, we test the node every t frames as before. As you can now see in the graph, there is no repetitive bottleneck as each node is queried at different frames providing an even distribution. The last building block is tight bounding volume. Used for interior nodes, a tight bounding volume is a collection of bounding volumes of its children nodes, but having tight bounding volumes is not always beneficial in some cases. For example, if we have multiple children nodes grouped closely together and their bounding volumes are overlapping, then it would simply be beneficial to just test the overall bounding volume of the parent node instead. Thus, in our search to create a tighter bounding volume, we have to test if the sum of the surface area of the bounding volumes of the children is not larger than s times the surface area of the parent node. So as you can see on the right, 
Um, as we approach an interior node and its bounding volume is visible, we traverse, but then we look at the tight bounding volume, which is a collection of the children's bounding volume, and we quickly realize that nothing is truly visible, thus saving two quarries of the children nodes. So here is the entire algorithm in its glory, and I know I'm kind of going over a little bit in time, but uh, if you guys want to come back to this and look at it at your own time, I highly encourage it because it goes into detail of what we just talked about and discussed. So now in terms of performance, CHC++ stacks up pretty well. As you can see, it's faster than view frustum calling almost all the time, and even in parts where CHC struggled before, and uh, you can see it significantly improves upon CHC uh, by many fold. So here we have a scene of a city landscape using CHC++. The smaller image on the right displays what is currently being rendered. And as you can see, it avoids rendering any hidden objects in the scene. It improved upon several issues of the old method, mainly the number of queries issued and this number of state changes. It's always better than view, uh, view frustum culling, and it gives up to two to three times speed up than uh, CHC. Uh, however, there are several parameters to set it up and get it going, which might make it slightly annoying to use. But it does the job, and, and it does it pretty well. So to wrap it all up, occlusion culling doesn't render objects hidden by other objects. Hardware occlusion queries make this possible as it uses GPU to query if an object's bounding box is visible. If it is, then it renders the complete object. Hierarchical stop and wait introduced a hierarchy structure, but still had too many CPU stalls and query overhead issues. CHC is an improvement as it doesn't have to wait for the query result to return since it guesses, but it still had too many queries and state changes for certain scenes. CHC++, however, fixes these issues by using query batching, multi-queries, randomization patterns, and tighter bounding volumes. And um, that basically sums it all up. And here are my references, and uh, thank you for watching.